Hello everybody, this is John Fan with SupernaturalHouseChurch.org or CWOWI.org or Church Without Walls International, all one word, Church Without Walls International.org. Today, coming a little different, and I'm going to post this on our website, YouTube, etc., but really, really feeling the need to define the biblical house church. And the reason for defining the biblical house church is very simple. I get inquiries and I have conversations with people all the time that say something like, oh, we're doing house church. I remember one time talking to a pastor and he was talking about, oh yeah, we do house church. And I said, I said really, what do you do? And he says, well, you know, we have our normal Sunday morning and then we do uh, small groups on uh, Wednesday nights. And I had to tell him, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's not house church uh, as the Bible defines it. And we have other people, I'll talk to other people, and they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 we do house church. Well, first it was a G12, then it was an alpha group, and, you know, we do a house church, you know, and that's really where our life is. And, and I'll ask them, you know, is that all there is? Is the house church you're meeting? Uh, well, no, 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 we go to the regular church on Sunday morning, and, and everything. I say, well, that's not what the Bible defines as house church. And so the, and, and then you throw in the fact that there are, um, that there are things called organic church and simple church. Years and years ago, years and years ago, I met with some men that I, I know and I respect, uh, the late Jim Rutz, who wrote Mega Shift, which is an excellent book I'd recommend for everyone, um, uh, Wolfgang Simpson, um, uh, Neil, uh, what's his, <laughs> I'm trying to remember all the different people that were there. A lot of people in, in leaders, in writers and thinkers in, and this was years ago. This was in house church and all that. And, uh, and, and they were thinking, you should we call it house church, simple church, organic church. What do you call it? What do you define when, when a group of believers meet together in a home and looking for solutions? Uh, Neil Cole, that's who I was looking for. Neil Cole, uh, Wolfgang Sinsom, Jim Rutz, and many others. And we were all get, having a, a retreat at uh, Jim Rutz's house in Colorado Springs. And, and, you know, Jim's in heaven now. I miss him. Miss his friendship. He was a unique guy, that's for sure. Um, but but the thing on my heart and what the Lord asked me to do is to bring the biblical uh, the biblical house church as it's defined in the Bible. And so that's what I'm doing. Now, people call it organic church and simple church. And I've had lunch with people. I've met with people. I've retreats with people. And to the person, they want to stay away from the word or the, the, the thought of, and let's be real quiet about it, leadership. They don't want to say the word leaders. They use words like uh, facilitator. Who's going to facilitate tonight? Who, or they're going to say the organizer or the one who's going to be in charge. But they don't want to use the word leader because leader implies elder or deacon or something like that. And, and almost to the person that I've dealt with uh, among readers and uh, or writers and leaders and everything else for their, what, 16 years of doing this now that I'm saying this, uh, they've been burned in the traditional church by leaders. And so they don't want to use the word leaders because of the connotation that it conveys to other people. In the same way they don't want to use, and, and I admittedly the same thing, elders and deacons and things like that that the Bible uses. And I would say this, that in when Paul's writing the New Testament, the words like apostle and deacon and elder and bishop and all those, those are verbs. Those are action words. Those describe a function. Today, they've become nouns. They've become something you put on a nameplate, you know, that says, hey, I'm bishop so-and-so, or you put in front of your name. Shame on us. Shame on modern culture. In Paul's day, they were verbs. They were action words. They were sent ones. They were overseers. They were servants. You know, they were action words, but we've made them into nouns, which God never intended. So what's a biblical house church look like? What's it look like? Well, let's look at history. Let's look at scripture. Uh, certainly in history, we know they went from the day of Pentecost to the year 313 AD when Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity because Christianity had so saturated the Roman Empire that they legalized it. So how did they get from the day of Pentecost with 120 people who'd been praying and seeking God to being the religion of the Roman Empire and being legalized and saturating the whole Roman Empire? How did they do that? Well, historically, we know how they did it. They did it from house to house. They met in home meetings. It wasn't until after the year 313 that they were called out of homes. In fact, I, my wife and I were at a visiting ruins in Europe, and we had an archaeologist leading the ruin. It was not a Christian 
tour or anything else. It was just we were taking a tour of a place or some Roman ruins. We came upon a temple of Apollos that was later, she explained, this archaeologist explained, was later a church. And she said this, she said, because the, they realized when they legalized Christianity that the setup for Apollo and the temple of Apollo, which had pews and a platform and a pulpit and one person in charge, was perfect when they called people out of homes. This was a secular archaeologist who was telling us this, and I was amazed that she got it right uh, when so many Christians get it wrong. Um, that, that when Constantine legalized Christianity, he, he, call, he took over the pagan temples because they used, this, they used uh, something which, which he thought would be helpful, which would be pews and platform and pulpit and everything. They put one guy in charge called the, 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 the minister or the priest, that's the pastor, the minister, and because one person had to be in charge in such a structure. And, and so that's how we've had 1,700 years of it. But how did they get from the day of Pentecost to become legalized in Christianity? They met in homes. What does that look like? What does the Bible describe? How did they grow from, from Pentecost to saturating the homes of the Roman Empire? Well, we know that when they outgrew a home, they multiplied out, just like you see in seventh grade uh, science class, you know, where you see a cell and it, and it gradually forms kind of a waste there, a divide, and the chromosomes split up, and then it divides and stays attached, and it's got its DNA. They have the same chromosomes, the same DNA. And, and so then that splits and, and everything, and that's how they saturated the Roman Empire inside of less than 300 years. But what does the Bible actually say? That much is history. That much is beyond dispute. That much we know there's books and books and books and books written about how they went from house to house. They'd grow, they'd multiply, they'd multiply out. How did they do it? Acts 2.46 says this. It says, it says that they were daily in the temple, breaking bread, right after Pentecost, daily in the temple and breaking bread, going from house to house, breaking bread, house to house, breaking bread. Acts 2.42 says that they were in the apostles' fellowship and teaching, breaking bread and prayers. And 46 says they were going house to house. And this is the way it was structured. We have these homes mentioned in the New Testament. And, and I, I know for me, when I was studying house church, I was horrified at myself because at that time I'd walked with the Lord 25 years and I was horrified to discover that I had taken God's word out of context. I had not until that moment really realized in my brain that Paul and Peter and James and John and, and uh, uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke were all writing as apostles and writers and, and leaders doing church in the home and writing to people with church in the home. Uh, it had never occurred to me that the whole of the New Testament was within the context of the home, the fivefold ministry in the context of the home, the gifts of the Spirit in the context of the home. And, you know, and I had pulled it for 25 years. I'd pulled it out of the context and put it in an auditorium. Shame on me. I was horrified at that. And I started researching and realizing we have the, we have the names of where these letters were addressed. You know, at the end of Romans, in Romans 16, and also in 1 Corinthians 16, at the end of that, Paul talks about Aquila and Priscilla hosting the church in their home, which was in Rome at the time when he was writing to the Romans. Later, when he was writing from Ephesus, he talks about Aquila and Priscilla and the church in their house. There. So Aquila and Priscilla, who moved from Rome and he ended up in Ephesus, had church in their house wherever they went. Paul mentions, of course, Lydia in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 17, I think it's verse 5, it mentions in Thessalonica, the home of Justin, who hosted there. In chapter 18, we have the home of, of Justus, Gaius Justus, the Roman, who hosted along with Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, but Justus hosting in his house. And you go on and you, you, you read of, of Philemon verse 2 in Colossae, where Paul greets the church in his house. And you read of a woman named Nymphus in, in Colossians 4.15 in Laodicea and the church that meets in her house. And so you see that men and women, Lydia, Nymphus, etc., um, uh, Philemon, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, Justin, Jace, uh, Justice and Justin, you see these people that are mentioned. So when you read Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Thessalonians, you are reading these letters that are addressed to these people. The, the biblical church in the house rotated homes. They rotated who led each week. We know this from history. We know this from, from the pattern that was established. I see my time is almost up. I try to stay at 10 minutes and it's so frustrating. That's why this is part one. And next Monday, I'm going to 
do part two. But we know this, they rotated homes and they rotated who led. Today, folks, there's no getting around it. Somebody has to be in charge. You have to use the word leader. You can, you can mask it with facilitator, coordinator, host or hostess, but the fact is that there are leaders in the New Testament. So we know historically they met in homes, they would outgrow a home, but because they were used to rotating homes and they were used to rotating leaders, they knew that when they outgrew a home, they could multiply. And then this group, who was already used to, multiply, to, to rotating homes and leading, each person leading, each host or host was leading, that they were already used to doing that. So they just picked up and started rotating among themselves. And that is, that is the biblical house church. Why do I say that? Because many of those who call simple church, organic church, house church, use different terms. It is like a Bible study. It is like a, a youth group of teenagers. You can come and go as you please. There's no sense of community. There's no sense of commitment to one another. There's no sense of growth and discipleship. And that's what we want to stay away from. And that's why in part two next week, on next Monday, I'm going to describe to you some of the commitment level, the, the things that are, are mentioned in scripture as being part of a home-based church. It's not come and go as you please and, oh yes, we're doing house church. No, you're not. If you're not committed to growth in Christ, if it's not all about discipleship, if you're not committed to a group of believers to walk through life with them, you're not really doing the Bible described church in the house. They grew because they made disciples. God doesn't call people to plant house churches. God calls people to make disciples and out of that come house churches. You know, we establish house churches, but and we establish the relationships with one another. Those come naturally through the sense of community and the purpose of discipleship. But but you don't set about to make the structure. You follow life. You create life in Christ and say, where is God moving? And he's moving in the relationships. And you follow that, and it grows, and it develops. But, but just to say, hey, I'm coming and going, and I'm calling it a house church, and all we do is do a little Bible study. It's a house church. And house church is not a miniature, therefore, of what what we left. It's not one person in charge with a captive audience. And people would say to me, hey, I've been doing house church for 20 years. And it's the same six people with the same guy in charge. That's not house church, folks. House church has, has a, a, a pattern of of rotating homes, rotating who leads. Yes, there are host homes. Yes, there are core people. And next time I'm going to talk about, as I'm throwing this scattershot out there for you for, to provoke your thought, I'm going to share with you how they rotated, how they maintained leadership, why it wasn't just a miniature where one person was in charge and spoke the whole time, and the results of that sense of community and commitment to one another as they walk through life. The body of Christ needs the definition of what is a biblical house church because there are so many out there who think that they're doing house church when all they're really doing is going to an, a Bible study that's patterned after a teenage youth group that they can come and go as they please, or it's a miniature of the auditorium church, which is patterned after the pagan temples. It, whatever the case is, the, there is a need out there in the body of Christ to define the biblical house church. So this first element, rotating homes, rotating who leads, is something that we see in Scripture. We know that's how they saturated the Roman Empire inside of 300 years. And I'll talk about the leadership, talk about what it looks like in part two, which will be in a week next week. So if you're going to see this anytime after that, you're going to be able to see it bang, bang, bang and binge watch parts one and two. But next week, I'll talk more about the biblical house church. But these key elements from Acts 246, remember that they rotated homes, they rotated leaders, and they grew. And when they outgrew a home, because they were used to rotating homes and were used to rotating who leads, they, could, they were fully functioning and they stayed related to one another. And then they multiply and they multiply and they multiply. It's all there in nature. It's all there in the natural. All right. Right. We'll talk to you later. Sorry for the scatter shot. Uh, yeah, I know it's like swallowing water from a fire hose, but just go back over it and hopefully I've got you thinking. We'll talk to you next week.